So we want to keep that a priority. Amen? How many ready for the word? I'm ready. Matthew chapter number four, verse number one is where we're going to begin our reading today. Man, we're in part six. I just, y'all liked it. I love it. So we just kept going in this respectfully series. So we're, we're in part six today. We've been talking about, uh, we've been going to God's word, getting tips for tough talks. And we've had tough talks with everybody. Uh, today, Jesus is about to teach us how to have a tough talk with Satan. Got to talk to him too. <laughs> Matthew chapter 4, verse number 1. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It's written, Man shall not live on bread alone. On every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, then the devil took him to the holy city that, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written, He will command His angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you don't strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him and said, It's also written, Don't put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of this world and their splendor. He says, All of this I'll give you. If you'll bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Verse 11, the most, to me, contains the most powerful phrase in the passage. It says, then, this is what I think all of us want to happen in our life. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended to him. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. Not today, Satan. (laughs) <laughs> not, not, not today, Satan. Many of you who are watching this are probably unaware of this. Maybe you've been recently exposed to our ministry and are not aware of the reality that in 2014, I published my first and probably in my mind, my most important book. Yeah. It was called Represent Jesus. It was based on a series of sermons that I did probably around the year 2010, where I spent six months walking our church through the Gospels and only teaching character traits of Jesus. The premise of the series that was eventually turned into a book was this, there are two Jesuses that exist in most Christian spaces. The Jesus that's made in our image and the Jesus that's made in the image of God. Another way of saying it is this, within the Christian space, there's a tension we got to address between the Jesus we have in our head And the Jesus that's actually in the Bible. And these two don't always align. And this dissonance between these two Jesuses can be destructive. Because as a Christian, a person who is striving to be Christ-like, not just a person who likes Christ, how we behold Jesus affects how we behave in our lives. So if the Jesus we see is a judgmental one, we'll be judgmental. If he's mean, we'll be mean. If he's fundamentalist, we'll be fundamentalist. If he's sexist, we'll be sexist. If he's racist, we'll be racist. If he likes what we like, we'll like what we like. If he, come on, if, <laughs> we, we, it, it's, it's as Frank Sanchez of Assisi said, God made us in his image, but unfortunately, we return the favor. So what we have then in many, space, in many spaces is a misrepresentation of Jesus by Christians because of a misunderstanding about Jesus 
that's not often addressed in church. See, the Bible's clear that Jesus died to be my savior. And that's what we hear regularly repeated in church spaces. But the Bible also says he lived to be my example. So we need more than the dead Jesus. Come here. We need more than the resurrected Jesus. We need the Jesus that lived 33 years before he died. We need the Jesus that said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We we, we need the Jesus who lived because in his life, he teaches us how to live. Am I making sense here? So my argument when I did the series and wrote the book is this. What we need is not just better methodology in Christianity. We just don't need to make Jesus cool. We need to relearn who Jesus is. So Jesus needs to be represented to the Christian first. So that the Christian can properly represent that Jesus in their life. And one of the areas where I've seen great misrepresentation is the area I want to address in our time together today. Y'all not bored, are you? Okay, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. It's, it, I want to address this misconception about a personality trait of Jesus. I want to address the misconception that Jesus was a person who was passive. That is a misrepresentation of the Jesus of the Bible. There is an assumption that because he was meek, that this means he was weak. It is inconsistent with scripture. Weakness is a lack of ability of power. Meekness is power under control. So meekness is actually the ultimate expression of strength. Because it means you make a decision how you will and won't use it. This is what Jesus, Jesus displays meekness when he's taken into custody by religious leaders and Peter takes out his sword and cuts off an ear Jesus heals the hurt and wounded man and then reminds Peter see this see this not weak here this meek he he said now if I wanted to I could call for legions of angels If, if I wanted to it didn't have to be like this he has a recognition of what he could do But it says, I'm going to bring this under subjection because I'm going to use my strength strategically. This not weakness, it's meekness. See, this imagery or this idea that Jesus is passive is inconsistent with the Jesus we see in Scripture, but also unhelpful to us as believers. Watch this. Because I'm about to say something, get ready. I'm about to say something that may be a little jarring for some of us. Here it is. Jesus is not only the king of kings. Jesus is king of the clapback. See, no, 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 no. Before you disagree, hear me out and, 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 te- and test what I'm saying with the scriptures. I can take you all throughout scripture. And show you he had some of the most witty responses in human history. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I can show you things he called people and you say, oh my God. I can show you where he called religious leaders vipers. I can show you in John 8 where he told religious leaders, you are of your father, the devil. See, 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 we don't want this, Jesus, 
Come on, we want the Sunday school Jesus. We want the Jesus who had a perm. They didn't even have perms back then. We want Jesus who had a perm, who had blush and rosy cheeks. Now, how does a Middle Eastern man even look like that? Doesn't even, doesn't even make sense. But that's the Jesus that we want, who was a carpenter and not dirty. Who lifted wood and swung a hammer and there's no, come on, there's no dirt on him anywhere. We want tame Jesus. That's not the biblical Jesus. Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus was so radical they killed him. Hallelujah. And if you get Jesus loose out of your mind, you can get loose in your life. The reason some of us are tame is because you got a tame Jesus. And the reason some of us are apprehensive, we got an apprehensive Jesus. But when you see your Jesus as a barrier breaking, radical revolutionary, you say, I'm on this earth to turn some things upside down. Give me that Jesus. I need that one. I need that one. The one that say, nobody take my life. See, come on. Come on, we keep sanitizing the scriptures. Come on. Nobody take my life. Woo! Ain't nothing you can do to me that'll stop what God's getting ready to do for me. You didn't hear what I just said. Give me that Jesus. The Jesus that's sitting at the Last Supper knowing Judas is about to betray him and says, I'm not even going to try to talk you out of it. Whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Because whatever you do to me can't stop what God's getting ready to do for me. Give me that, Jesus. He said, oh, y'all threatening me, huh? You threatening me? You, th- you, you think I'm going to change what I said because you threatening me? Yeah, you, you think I'm going to be somebody who I'm not because you're threatening me? Destroy this temple if you want to. In three days. God will raise it back up again. Give me that Jesus. That Jesus is king of the clapback. Watch this. He models and mirrors. There are times he didn't say a word. But he also models and mirrors that some things do require a response. Sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There are some things that don't warrant a response. But there are other things that require a response. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And there's a lot of talk about this, but I believe Jesus models something for us. Regarding this, Jesus models this and his exchange in Matthew chapter 4 with Satan. Let's, let, let's unpack this now. We, we read it together. Verse 1 begins with this one word. And this one word is the word then. Everybody say then. then. Everybody say then. Come on, say it again. Say then. See, so, so in order to understand the significance of then, we need to understand what happened before then. What happened in Matthew chapter 3? Here it is, Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, says as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And the voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. In him, I'm well pleased. So after this, then, don't miss this. Jesus is baptized, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and gets the affirmation, public affirmation of his father regarding his identity I want you to see this are y'all following me it's a powerful picture of the way ministry which is service for God to others so whatever you do should be ministry this is a powerful picture of the way ministry is supposed to be done it's supposed to be done out of affirmation not for affirmation see y'all missed it Jesus is baptized in Matthew 3. He hadn't performed one miracle yet. He has not engaged in his public ministry. God says, I need to make sure you know who you are before you get busy so that you don't use your busyness to discover who you are. In other words, I don't want you attached to what you do. So I need you to know who you are before you start. 
Because when you know who you are, you know who you're not. Did you hear what I said? Yeah, and we will never be effective in our assignment trying to find our identity in it. So right, right, right. So church asks the question. Church asks the question, "What are you doing?" That's level two. Level three asks, "Why?" Yep. Level two says they come early, stay late. Level three say, "Why?" Level two says they always over everybody else helping them when they're, that's fine. Level three say, why though? Because the Bible says God looks past the motion and looks at the motive. Woo. Don't, are, y- are y'all here now? I say, are you here? All right. So <laughs> God says, this my beloved son. I'm trying to teach today because this is a teaching lesson but I feel a Mississippi storefront hand clapping foot stomping devil rebuking anointing on me today I did you hear what I just said I want you to see what's happening here the Bible says that the, that Satan comes don't miss this And challenges the very thing that the father said about him when he baptized him. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Are y'all here? Satan says, if you are the son of God. Did you hear what I just said? The adversary comes and tests him regarding whether or not you believe the truth that was just spoken about you. (laughs) You know what he's doing? Are y'all ready for this? Uh, Let's make a hermeneutical loop. Watch this. So, In the Garden of Eden, the first Adam is already made in the image of God. But he and Eve are tricked into eating eating the fruit. Eve's trick, he's influenced into eating the fruit. Because Satan said, God knows if you eat this, you'll be like him. (laughs) She already was. What he was trying to get her to prove. So when the second Adam, first Adam, it worked in the garden. The second Adam, or who Paul calls the last Adam, Jesus, goes into the wilderness. And the same way Satan showed up in the garden, he shows up in the wilderness. And he comes to this second Adam and he said, if you are. If you believe God's truth about you, then prove it. This is why people who go throughout life trying to, with their motivation, being, I've got to prove something to somebody. These people don't have a revelation of who they are. He says, if you, if you are the son of God, he atti- I want you to see what's happening here because I want you to see, please don't miss this, especially if you grew up Pentecostal or charismatic or you're neo-charismatic or you're exploring the things of the spirit. And I don't like those titles because basically it means you're a New Testament believer. I'm not even going to bother that, right? Because I think the New Testament is a book that shows us the, per- the, per- the perpetuation of spiritual gifts is what it means to be a New Testament believer. And when you got spiritual gifts, they're going to be spiritual abuses, but you don't throw the baby out with the bath water. You correct the abuse but you lose you use the gifts because if you disregarding the gifts you disregarding God gave somebody else for you yeah it's okay so I don't believe in prophecy till you need a word 
I don't believe in healing till you need a miracle. Till, did you hear what I just said? Till the doctors can't fix it or diagnose it and you got to go to the great physician. But I want you to listen here because I want you to see if, if we're actually going to pull our philosophies from the Bible, I want you to see Satan's primary mode of spiritual warfare. It's not demonic inhabitation or demonization. That's not his primary mode. That's extreme. That's not what he did to destroy Adam and Eve. And that's not what he did to try to destroy Jesus. What did he do? He argued truth. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying his, his modus operandi is arguing truth. <laughs> Warfare is going on right here. Your mind is a field. The mind field is the battleground for the adversary. And his modus operandi is to argue truth. There can't even be any demonization or influence without us entertaining the truth, entertaining his argument regarding the truth. So there would be less needs for exorcisms. Less need for, which I think, I think authentic exorcisms, one, are pretty rare. I don't think everything we call that is that. That's, that's one, right? Mm -hmm, right, okay, right. Because yeah, the evidence of uh, divine intervention and freedom from satanic bondage is what happens after the service, not during. It's are you free? Not did you foam at the mouth. Are you free? See? <laughs> but 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 that would be less need like the frequent need for that is an indication that we got the gate of our mind open. He's all in the house because the front door's open. He's sitting on the couch because the front door's open. We've got to close the door. All throughout scripture, we see this. Him arguing against God's truth. In the day that you eat, you won't die. You will not. God said, the day that you eat, Genesis 3, the day that you eat, you'll die. Genesis 2. Satan says to Eve the exact opposite. You will not certainly die. He's arguing truth. Paul talks about this. When he talks about spiritual warfare in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse number 4, he says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Do you know what a stronghold is? Right? Un Biblical thinking patterns. Did you hear what I just said? Unbiblical thinking patterns that make our mind and heart resistant to truth. See, stronghold is not handcuffs in the Bible. When you see stronghold in the, uh, why does this feel like I don't, I don't, uh, a Bible study? But here, when, when, when you, yeah, we got to get this right though. We got to, so, so here it is. I want you to catch this, right? Strongholds in the Bible. The Bible talks about David going to a stronghold. That's a fence. It's a fortress. It's something that stopped enemies from getting in. And so when Paul's using his stronghold language, he's pulling from that imagery, saying they're unbiblical thinking patterns that put a fence in your mind that make you resistant to truth. So you can hear sermons you never use. Because there's a thinking pattern there that's been informed or influenced or erected because of something. See, some strongholds are erected. See, there are a number of different things that cause people to build strongholds. Strongholds function the same way, but some, sometimes people get pain, and, and as a result of their pain, it produces a thinking pattern, and they build a stronghold. 
Hurt in a relationship. All men or women aren't good. That becomes a thinking pattern. Now that's offense. So now everybody you meet has to prove to you they're not your ex. See, this is too much. Isn't it? Come on. Thinking patterns. Somebody hurts. Somebody hurts us. That pain says, I'm not trusting anybody else again. That becomes a thinking pattern, a stronghold. Now, no matter how many sermons or series we hear on forgiveness, it can't take root in the heart. That's how people can sit under word for years and not change. It's a stronghold. But the devil's mad today. I said he's mad today. I said he's upset today. Because Paul said we can pull down. Now it makes sense, doesn't it? He said pull that stronghold down. We're getting ready to pull down everything that's blocking your blessing. We're getting ready to pull down everything that's blocking your focus. We're getting ready to pull down everything that's blocking your peace. That stronghold has to come down. And some of us are dealing with generational strongholds. But it's getting ready to stop with you. See? See? See, I used to be a little timid to use this language because of the abuses, but the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me about this and bringing credibility back to charismatic movements and to say we're not just mindless, dumb, unread, unintellectual people. Yeah, sola scriptura, therefore charismatic. I believe the Bible, so I believe in the Holy Ghost. You didn't hear what I said. Yeah, I believe in the Holy Ghost because I believe the Bible. And we, I'm speaking to somebody that's watching this. You're a curse breaker. What do I mean by that? You're about to break that generational pattern. Watch what it says. Paul says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now watch what it says here. Uh, give me verse 5 on the screen, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Watch this. We demolish arguments. Come on. Is that, am I reading the Bible? All I'm doing is reading the Bible. <laughs> That's it. It says we demolish arguments and every pretension, listen to Paul's language, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. He said it's arguments. Paul said that's what we're fighting. We're fighting satanic reasoning. We're fighting satanic logic. And he says we're going to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Did you hear what I just said? Satan is trying to stop our progress, block our blessing through constant arguments. He's arguing with you in your head. You hearing this word? He arguing with you right now. See, it doesn't matter how clear the word is. It doesn't matter how convinced I am. Whether or not it takes root in the ground of your heart, it's based on whether or not you win the argument that Satan's going to have with you. Because whatever you hear in chapter 3, he's going to test in chapter 4. Hey! I can say you the head, not the tail. And in chapter 4, he's going to come back and say, really? I can say you're above only and not beneath. In chapter 4, he's going to come back and say, really? I can say you are, you are a generational shifter and curse breaker. He's going to come back in chapter 4 and say, yeah. And if you and I don't know how to manage these moments where he's arguing with us, his arguments are going to keep us under arrest. And many of us are losing spiritually because we lose in the argument. Did you hear what I just said? That we want to pass, I'm coming to church and I'm reading my Bible and I'm studying and I'm worshiping, but there's still errors I just can't get victory over. It's not that you're losing in prayer, it's not that you're losing in the Bible study, it's not that you're losing in worship attendance. You might be losing the arguments. It's you letting him talk you out of what God has talked you into you, he, watch this he is causing you to question the credibility of what God told you in a previous season you better hear me I love this though because the text teaches us how to manage these moments <laughs> Jesus models for us what to do 
when the enemy argued with him, he clapped back. Some of us said, just ignore the devil. That's not what Jesus did. If you're the son of God, turn these stones to bread. I know you're hungry. You've been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. I know you're hungry. And I want you to turn these stones to bread because I don't want you to be led by your assignment. I want you to be led by your appetite. (laughs) That way I know every time I get ready to derail you, I just got to make you hungry. Because everybody hungry for something. Somebody hungry for fame. Somebody hungry for power. Somebody hungry for influence. Somebody hungry for notoriety. He says, all I got to do, I, I just want to make, I, I know you have hunger because you're human. I want to make sure y'all okay with that, right? Because level two wants you to deny that. But level three, you keep it real, right? You, you got some hunger. Jesus teaches you how to have it and not be led by it. Say, I'm hungry to go this way, but I'm going to walk the other way. And it doesn't mean I'm not hungry. It just means I'm committed. It doesn't mean I'm not hungry. It just means I'm sold out. Somebody put truth in the chat if I'm telling the truth. You know you're hungry. That's human. It's human to be hungry. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually. (laughs) He said, I know you're hungry. Turn these stones to bread. Jesus said, it's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the enemy came back again, and Jesus clapped back again. Then the enemy came back again, and Jesus clapped back again. Jesus argued until the devil left him alone. Verse 11 says, and Satan left him. (laughs) Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, you need to watch this. Watch this. I know people talk about outsmarting the devil. There's a book out called Outwitting the Devil. I want to talk to you about outlasting the devil. Because you can handle his arguments better than he can handle that word. When you start whipping that word on him, that word starts wounding him in a way that you're not wounded by his arguments. Because his arguments aren't truth. Your arguments are truth. And because his arguments aren't truth, his arguments aren't a sword. The word is a sword. Y'all not hear what I'm saying. You talk back till he leaves you alone. I said you talk back until he leaves you alone. You talk back every time he talk to you. You're not going to make it. Yes, I will. Did you hear what I said? And watch this. Even, watch this. I'm getting ready to go somewhere. Even when you don't talk back, when you're talking back, and you can't find a scripture to quote, Use a saying that's scripturally based. Because that's how a generation that came before me got through some of the most tumultuous times in human history. They didn't have, all of them didn't have amazing levels of literacy. So they couldn't quote certain things verbatim. But they, kept, they had sayings that were based on scriptural statements. And those sayings, because they were grounded in truth, became a weapon that they would use to fight against discouragement and despair. Well, come on now. So they wouldn't quote Hebrews 10, 36. You have need of patience so that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. They would say he may not come. Y'all better come get me today when you want him. He may not come. When you call him, but he's always on time. It's a saying that's grounded in scripture. Argue back. Argue back. He's going to tell you not a leader. Yes, I am. (laughs) He wouldn't call me to it if he didn't equip me for it. It's in me. 
This not in you, it's in me. This not, they said it wasn't in Gideon, but it was in him. They said a baby wasn't in Sarah, but it was in him. In her. Argue back. Whether or not you have faith or fear is based on who wins the argument. Whether or not there's growth or stagnation is based on who wins the argument. Whether or not there's freedom or bondage is based on who wins the argument. It's based on do I believe what God said to me in chapter 3 when it is tested in chapter 4. I know arguing gets draining. It takes spiritual and mental energy. That's why one of Satan's tactics is to wear you down. It's to wear you down. To, like he did Samson. Let me cut off your strength. Then I'm going to send the Philistines when you don't have no fight left. Have you ever dealt with some adversity and said, Lord, not now. Yeah, yeah, I, I prefer not ever, but if it's going to happen, not now. But I, I, I love this. God is so faithful. He knows these arguments. It takes, it takes energy. It takes strength. Because the devil, God's using his word. The devil's using your circumstance and your experience. And he's trying to use your experience as an authority instead of God's word. What does that mean? It's like, yeah, you said that last time and you didn't. You tried before and you did. So he's trying, to, he's trying to use your experience as an authority. But all of these miracles we see in the New Testament where the writers let us know how long these people wrestle with these issues are there to let us know that your experience is not an authority. I don't care if you've been by the pool of Bethesda 38 years. When God gets ready for you to take up your bed and walk, he will make happen in one day what could not happen in 38 years. For 38 years, that man went to that pool and said, this is my year. And it was never his year. And if he let his experience be an authority, he would have stopped going on the 37th year, not realizing that the 38th year was the year Jesus was going to walk by his bed and say, do you want to be made whole? So he knows, God knows it takes energy. We get depleted. So what does the text say? The text says that he sent angels. We don't need angels to do. Angels don't work in us. The Bible says angels work for us, right? So the equivalent of that for us would be the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. When we're depleted, he says, I'm going to give you a, I'm going I'm to I'm orchestrate a season where I'm going to let the devil leave your mind alone so that I can replenish you. And I'm replenishing you because he's going to come another way. Because he knows the only way he wins is if you quit. <laughs> he knows the only way he wins is if you quit. And I got two words for you. I'm done. Don't quit. Jesus. Don't quit. Jesus. Whoa. Don't quit. Don't be weary in doing good for in due season you'll reap 
If you don't faint, don't you faint. Don't faint. Don't collapse. I know it's exhausting, but don't faint. I know it's wearing on you, but don't you, don't you faint. David said, I would have fainted. He said, I almost, listen, David said, I almost fainted. I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not to see the goodness when I die. Not when I get to heaven, but in the land of the living. He said, I wouldn't I would quit if I didn't believe. There was a brighter day coming. Not today, Satan. I'm taking this one day at a time. Not today. You might have had my mind yesterday. Not today. I don't know what's going to happen next week. Not today. You argue back. You argue back. You argue back. <laughs> the beginning of this pandemic, the devil told me I wasn't going to have a church. We're coming out of the pandemic with more than we would end with. <laughs> Woo! Did you hear what I just said? Don't quit. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for some people who say, man, I believe God, but Woo. He's been wearing, the devil's been wearing me out with his arguments. <laughs> I want to pray for you today. I'm going to pray that God gives you the wit of Jesus. hi ya That your tongue would become a weapon. That just like the prophet Jeremiah, he would give you the tongue of the learned that you might speak a word in season to him that is weary, including yourself. You have a learned tongue. A tongue that's under the influence of the Holy Spirit that will push back darkness and clap back against the enemy. Father, I thank you. And I pray in the name of Jesus, our high priest, who gives us access to your ear. I pray in Jesus' name for every person right now watching this message, listening to this message, wherever they are, I pray for an invasion of the Holy Spirit. I pray right now that you would overwhelm and overtake them. May they even sense you in their senses. May they feel your nearness. May they sense that you are at work now, working in them the wit of Jesus. I pray for wit now. I pray for a witty tongue to clap back with biblical truth to the enemy, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray not only for wit, I pray for resilience. I pray for grit. I pray for endurance. I pray for stamina. I pray for impartations of stamina now, God. As your word says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I pray for that now. And I pray that your Holy Spirit, according to Romans 1.11, would impart it unto your people. I pray for divine deposits of strength that we could not conjure up on our own. Strength that is a gift from you. I pray for that now in Jesus' name. Stamina to finish strong. And I pray for those who are depleted. Not only wit, not only resilience, I pray for refreshing and replenishment. Yeah. Just as the angels attended to Jesus, may you attend to them now. Yeah. May you, may you, woo, may you rebuild the broken pieces of the walls of resistance. Where their walls of resistance have been torn down and where there are holes and breaches. I pray that you'd rebuild and refortify. And I just pray that now that you would replenish 
and refresh them. Now, your word says times of refreshing come from the Lord. And we just, we just pray and we believe that this is a time of refreshing. It's coming from you. Your people are being refreshed in the language of antiquity. Refreshed to run on and to see what the end is going to be. I pray this in the name of Jesus. If you receive it in this studio, I want you to give God praise. I want you to put fire in that chat. Come on.